Thank you, Dan. <laughs> General Sir Richard Shereff was born in Kenya in 1955 and comes from a distinguished military family. His father, David, served in the King's African Rifles, which was my regiment also, and David achieved remarkable combat successes during World War II in Ethiopia, Madagascar, and Burma, winning many combat decorations. General Sir Richard graduated from Oxford University before being commissioned into the British Army from Sandhurst. In his 37-year career, he commanded troops on operations at every level from platoon to division. This includes combat in the Gulf War of 1991 in Iraq, <coughs> Northern Ireland, Kosovo, and Bosnia. In addition, he has extensive staff experience at Brigade, Army Headquarters, the Ministry of Defense, and commanded NATO's Allied Rapid Reaction Corps. His final military assignment was NATO's four-star Deputy Supreme Allied Commander Europe, a position once held by Field Marshal Montgomery. In addition, in addition to these accomplishments, he is an honorary fellow of Exeter, Exeter College, Oxford. In 2016, he published a book titled 2017, War with Russia. It became a bestseller and has been published and has been translated into eight languages. Also, in 2016, he co-founded Strategia Worldwide Limited, a global risk advisory company. He's a regular contributor on security and defense issues on BBC, ITV, and several other media outlets. Ladies and gentlemen, General Sir Richard Shereff. Thank you. thank you very much indeed for that uh, introduction. It's great to hear you again after so long. I hope you're keeping well. Um, and I'm so pleased you mentioned the King's African Rifles, and you can probably see my father keeping a watch over me on my left, over my left shoulder to make sure I stay on track. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure also and a great honor to be addressing you today in Toronto, and I'm only sorry that um, geography has prevented me from being with you. So I'm speaking to you from my home in the village of Tillshead in the heart of Salisbury Plain. Um, as Kamal said, I was the Deputy Supreme Allied Commander of Europe. Now we're all prisoners of our experience. I stepped down uh, in April 2014. So as you can imagine, the last couple of months or so were very much taken up with watching what was going on in Ukraine, the Maidan revolution, followed by the very uh, professional and slick operation by the Russians to annex Crimea. And I say that not out of any admiration, but purely from an objective military perspective. The NATO concept of 2010 stated that Russia should be NATO's most important strategic partner. So to that end, as the DSACA, I was in and out of Moscow pretty regularly. I met General Gerasimov on a number of different occasions. Indeed, he came to visit, I invited him to visit SHAPE, the NATO strategic headquarters where I operated out of. And he had lunch with us at our home. Um, and I spoke several times at the General Staff Academy. So uh, when the uh, Russians annexed Crimea, it absolutely came out of a clear blue sky and was a complete 
surprise to NATO, which I think is an indication as much as anything of the NATO mindset of the day. The scales came off, or they should have come off our eyes at that time, but they did not. And I want to take you to a speech that Putin made in the Kremlin on the 18th of March, 2014. Now, I heard one of your questioners say, Russia will never change. She was absolutely right. But it's a great shame that Europe, the rest of Europe, did not understand that. In that speech, the day Crimea was incorporated into the Russian Federation, Putin gave us a very useful insight into his thinking. And it's important to remember that and to look at those words because they are as relevant today, nearly 10 years later, as they were then. He majored on the threat the West posed to Russia. Time and again, he said we were deceived. Time and again, the decisions were made behind our backs. And the same happened when they made their expansion to the West with the deployment of military structures on our borders. Once again, that old chestnut about NATO being the cause of all this. This grievance was set predictably in a historical context to make it resonate more. We have all the reasons to believe that the policy of containment of Russia that was happening in the 18th, the 19th, and the 20th centuries is still going on. And he warned the West to expect Russia to push back. If you press the spring, it will release at some point something you should remember. As for Ukraine, we are not just neighbors, we are one nation. Kiev is the mother of Russian cities, and what he described as the latest events in Ukraine, he said, were the product of terror, murder, pogroms conducted by anti-Semites, Russophobes, nationalists, and neo-Nazis. That same revolting language that we hear, again, all too often today, deep in the Russian psyche. And his vision for the future, uniting Russian speakers under Russia as the desire of the people, the absolute majority of the people is clear. 95% of the Russian population think that Russia should protect the interests of Russians, even if it will worsen our relations at some point. And he was, of course, predictably reassuring about Russia's good intentions for the future of Ukraine and what he calls other regions by which we can infer. He means other states with significant Russian ethnic minorities. And here, of course, I think of the Baltic states, loyal NATO member states with significant Russian-speaking minorities. And it was that, in a sense, that was the trigger for the book that I wrote. He said, don't trust those who frighten you with Russia, those who say that Crimea will be followed by other regions. We do not want to split Ukraine. When he's right, he doesn't want to split Ukraine. He wants Ukraine incorporated in a second Russian empire. And of course, his words matched his deeds with the annexation of Crimea, an expectation back in March 2014 that he was about to use, invade Ukraine because we saw a significant buildup of troops, aircraft, tank divisions, tank armies, airborne divisions, all on the point of invading Ukraine. He pulled back from that and initiated a proxy invasion with the so-called establishment of the People's Republics of Donetsk and Luhansk. And the war in Ukraine started in 2014. By 2024, 2022, some 14,000 Ukrainians had been killed in that war. And meanwhile, London continued to gorge itself on Russian money. Many other countries made the most of Russians. London and Britain became a home for Russian oligarchs. Sanctions after Ukraine, nothing. And meanwhile, what did NATO do? Well, okay, the 2014 NATO summit in, in, war, in, uh, in Wales that led to the establishment of the enhanced forward battle groups, of which Canada, of course, leads one in Latvia and the British in Estonia um, and, and the Germans uh, in Lithuania with the Americans uh, at a, uh, with a battle group on the Polish border. But that was pretty much nothing. Um, so that situation did not come out of a clear blue sky. And it's worth remembering that because it has implications for the way we behave, behave in future. And I think we need to consider the context too. 
because in a sense it takes two to tango. We've seen swinging defence cuts, particularly in the last two decades, in Europe and I dare say in Canada as well. Effectively the dismantling of our warfighting capability. The NATO summit at Bucharest in 2007, a promise to NATO, uh, Ukraine of NATO membership, but a promise that was never going to be backed up given the context of the day, because to back it up and ensure NATO was able to implement that fundamental principle of Article 5 would have meant putting troops on the ground and aircraft in the sky above Ukraine. Georgia, 2008, our Rhineland moment. What did we do after that? We went back to business as usual with Russia. The legacy of President Obama's red line in Syria in 2013, which of course he did not match up to. The Trump years, contempt for NATO and its allies. Although I tell you one thing, Trump was right on one thing, which was the issue of burden sharing and Europe for being prepared to step up uh, in terms of defense spending. President Macron describing NATO as brain dead and the Afghan catastrophe of 2021, all sent a powerful message that NATO was going to be, was well on the way to being a busted flush. So how does it look now if NATO failed to match the moment then? Well, let's just look a couple of, at a couple of major underestimates by Putin uh, in this war. Firstly, Ukrainian defense, the courage, resourcefulness, determination, commitment, agility, skill, uh, it has been quite extraordinary. Truly, in a very real sense, this has been Ukraine's 1940 moment. Ukraine has given us a masterclass in defense with a battle for Kiev, a defeat of the Russians very early on, and then subsequently a masterclass in operational design, planning and implementation with uh, counteroffensives in Kharkiv and Kherson last year. Extraordinary fortitude throughout this winter of desperate attritional fighting, fighting on a scale probably not seen in some cases since Passchendaele, Verdun, the Somme, Vimy Ridge to Canadians, you know what I mean. And the blunting and defeat of that Russian winter offensive. I've no doubt there's more to come. And of course, we wait to see what follows. And that, as I heard the ambassador say so clearly, so much depends on this summer's offensive. And if there are any Ukrainians in the audience, I have to say I can't see you, although you can see me. Allow me to pay the most heartfelt tribute to the courage of your countrymen and women. Russian capability. We've got to be careful here. Yes, the Russians screwed it up right royally at the start. A failure of operational design, planning and execution, command, incompetence in combined arms, operations, logistics, etc., etc. But never underestimate the Russians. Never underestimate your enemy. They have suffered staggering losses. But they are learning and adapting, and they will continue to play to their strengths. Mass artillery, mass attacks by expendable manpower, which they can continue to replace, as well as the horrific brutality uh, as well. They are determined to outsuffer Ukraine and to outsuffer the West and its allies. What about NATO? Putin assumed that NATO would roll over and accept the reality. The converse has happened. Instead of less NATO, Putin's got more NATO. I was in NATO headquarters yesterday and the day before, talking to NAC ambassadors, and I can't tell you what a joy it was to see the Finnish ambassador there. And I've no doubt that we will see the Swedish ambassador there as well pretty soon. That NATO support has been critical to Ukraine. What you don't read about has been the extensive non-lethal support. The lethal support, although uh, has been provided by NATO allies for very good reasons, has been provided on a bilateral basis. But it's been okay. It's been a pretty good show. But politically, the message could not be stronger. I think if we'd been talking in April 2022, we would have assumed that by now, April 2023, 
at least some NATO countries, and I'm not going to name them, would have been pushing hard for a negotiated ceasefire. Less President Macron's visit to, in a sense, Kowtow to President Xi recently, uh, that the NATO the alliance is staying pretty firm on that. But is it enough? NATO has armed Ukraine well enough to avoid defeat. But we have seen, let's be clear, an utterly invidious distinction between offensive and defensive weapons. Any soldier knows the best form of defense is attack. And the result has been the buildup of an offensive capability needed to allow Ukraine to defeat the Russians and achieve their military objectives has been too slow. And as a result of that, opportunities have been missed. If the tap had been properly turned on on the 24th of February or the 25th of February last year, indeed, if the tap had been turned on in March 2014, we wouldn't be where we are. And Ukraine might have been able to have seized the opportunity after their defeat of the Russians at Kherson in November to roll up the Russians before they were able to redeploy. If they had had the capability, they might have put significant Russians into the bag as it was, large numbers of Russians got away. And yes, the Russians have been blunting themselves and slaughtering their young men in droves with their winter attacks, but they have also been able to redeploy, consolidate, start preparing defensive positions and have prepared them. And the consequence for the Ukraine, for Ukraine and the Ukrainian armed forces is that any successful counteroffensive is gonna be a hell of a lot harder that if they had been given to the tools to do the job right at the start of the war. And what we have seen, I'm afraid to say, has been an incremental approach by NATO nations and other allies to the provision of military support. Again and again, the response to Ukrainian requests for support has been, no, no, okay, well, maybe. Think tanks, for example. What is needed is a clear NATO strategy with a clearly defined end state from which the ways and means to achieve it are derived. But to do this, we have to recognize that we face a general, a generational challenge. Once again, we have a bloodstained tyrant prepared to inflict unspeakable damage on a democratic, peaceful neighbor here in Europe. We've been here before in 1934, 39 to 45. There will be no peace in Europe while Putin or a Putin lookalike is in the Kremlin. And if Putin does go, absolutely, he will be replaced by somebody equally hardline, equally ultra-nationalist, perhaps more so, and equally determined to build another Russian empire. We have to understand that we are at war in the transatlantic region. This is not just a war against Ukraine. It's a war against NATO and a war against democracy, liberty, and all that is reasonably good. It's a war that is physical in Ukraine. It's a war that is informational, economic, and energy against the rest of us. And it's a war that could easily go physical as well for the whole of NATO. And we should be clear as well that any negotiation that allows Putin to keep any sizable chunk of Ukrainian territory will have rewarded his aggression and cannot happen. It won't stop him and his desire to build a new Russian empire because all he will do is rest, rebuild, regenerate, retrain and start all over again. Russia, has never been a nation state in the sense that America has been a nation state since 17, a sovereign nation since 1776, Britain since the Act of Union, France or Germany. Russia's never been a sovereign state in that respect. It has only been an empire. It can only survive by dominating and growing in imperial terms, and it remains an imperial construct. This is a war between the old and the new, the old imperialist mindset and a new 
21st century mindset, liberty, freedom, democracy. We are witnessing the final collapse of the Russian empire that was started 30 years ago with the collapse of the Soviet Union. And if that's right, it's going to be a bloody, a long drawn out business. Think the Bosnian wars of the 1990s were the consequences ultimately of the collapse of the Ottoman Empire 75 years earlier. So Europe has a problem. We all have a problem. Canada has a problem. America has a problem because Europe, Europe's security is Canada's security and America's security. We have a deeply traumatized state and people marked by years of trauma, of brutality, of the communist era, the civil war, the purges, terror, World War II, the great patriotic war casualties, Afghanistan, and now Ukraine, which has never made any attempts to come to terms with its brutal past, unlike Germany. Russia will remain a problem for Europe until it changes. And it is only going to change if what was done to Germany in 1945 is done to Russia, and that is not going to happen. So I heard the lady in the audience say Russia will change, and I say a will not change, and I say absolutely amen to that. So we will have an angry, destructive, ultra-nationalistic, economically failing, nuclear-armed neighbor, which thinks Russia has some sort of lunatic right, or a divine right to be a third Rome, determined to build a Russian empire and to remove Ukraine from the map as an independent country on our border for decades to come. So we have a generational challenge to deter Russia. We will have to fight a second Cold War to prevent a third world war. So what? A NATO change of mindset is needed. We've got to recognize that we are at war. Our populations, our politicians, have not begun to make that switch yet at all. This is going to require significant defense spending, rearming in order to deter. We need to build a war economy that can turn out the equipment, the capability, the artillery shells and other ammunition to retool industry to do it. Above all, there's gotta be a mindset change in NATO. And the, rec the alliance has got to recognize that it is at war. As far as Russia is concerned, it was Dmitry Trenin who headed up the Carnegie Moscow Center who said, Russia, the Kremlin, has been at war with NATO since 2014. So we've got to wake up and smell that particular coffee as well. And if NATO fails to do enough to ensure that Ukraine prevails against Russia this year, we will face without question the need or direct and appallingly costly interventions in future. If fa NATO fails to match this moment, be assured some future successor of Putin will have another go. The NATO summit in Vilnius this year is an opportunity for the Alliance to lay out a clear strategy for a NATO defense and deterrence posture that substantially and materially reinforces European security and peace, and indeed transatlantic security and peace. To state with a clarion call that there will be a band of deterrent steel along NATO's eastern flank, which underscores NATO's resolve to support Ukraine with whatever means are required to ensure Russia's defeat, that fully endorses Ukraine's war aims, and announces a significant package of the sort of military assistance that casts away limitations on offensive capability for Ukraine and gives them the means to do the job to defeat Russia. Specifically, of course, things like attackums. Does Ukraine need to actually assault Crimea? Probably not. I would suggest the indirect approach might work better. Isolate it. Get yourselves within range of Crimea, particularly with long range precision missiles, and then make it impossible for the Russians to hold it. That would be a total humiliation uh, for Putin. 
above all, that strategy must lay out a clear vision of a Europe whole and free where Ukraine is integrated into the transatlantic community as a member of NATO. I would go further and include Georgia and Moldova in that as well. But at the same time, all NATO member states must look to their own defenses and be ready for the worst case. And the worst case is war with Russia. That means that all the components of readiness, people, logistics, equipment, training, especially ammunition, need to be put in place. There must be deterrence across the spectrum, not only conventional deterrence, but also nuclear deterrence too, and defense against what will continue to be a long-term hybrid asymmetric threat. Think, of course, cyber. NATO will get things done. It always does. But you have to remember with NATO that it is a consensus organization, which is a great, great strength, but it also imposes limits on how quickly and how, how, if, how, how quickly you can achieve things. It can only move at the speed of the slowest ship in the convoy. So we may not get that Karen call strategy, but I can tell you that people within NATO are working towards that Ukrainian membership. And meanwhile, there will need to be the tightest possible security measures put in place bilaterally. There can be no repeat of the failure of the Budapest Memorandum. Think of the measures that, and the support that the United States, States gives to Israel to guarantee its defense. That is the sort of thing, but it's not just the United States. European nations must also step up to the mark. Let me conclude then with Trotsky's chilling words. You may not be interested in war, but war is interested in you. To which the only response is the old Roman maxim, if you want peace, prepare for war. Thank you for listening to me. This has been another in our series of webcasts produced by the Royal Canadian Military Institute in Toronto as a public educational service. You can find news of upcoming events and links to our webcast archives at www.rcmi.org. On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying goodbye for now and thank you for joining us. Thank you.